Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar between PPMD and Dyne Therapeutics. Um, I wanna thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, we're looking forward to uh, this, this conversation where we can learn a little bit more about Dyne's uh, FORCE platform and their phase one, two uh, clinical trial with uh, Dyne 251, which is a product for those amenable to Exxon 51 skipping. Uh, joining me today to walk through the presentation um, is Ash Dugar, the Chief Medical Affairs Officer from Dyne. And um, we're also joined by Molly White, the VP Global Head of Patient Advocacy at Dyne. Um, so as the uh, presentation goes along, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them to the chat box at the bottom. We'll try to get through as many of those questions in the Q&A portion at the end as we can. Um, and of course, we are recording this webinar. So if you have to step away or if you have friends or family members who this might be relevant to, um, please feel free to share it with them. Uh, we'll typically, we'll have this up uh, sometime, uh, likely next week um, for that for sharing. But with that, we can um, get started for the, the talk today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ash, who's gonna uh, take us through the presentation. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, so as Eric mentioned, I'm Ash Tugar, the Chief Medical Affairs Officer at Dine Therapeutics. And joining me is Molly White, our Global Head of Patient Advocacy. And uh, Molly will come back on um, when we do the Q&A at the end of the talk. First, I'd like to thank Pat, Eric, Stephanie, and the amazing uh, PPMD organization for inviting us to present at this webinar to update the Duchenne community on the progress of our program, and specifically Dine 251, our clinical candidate to treat patients with Duchenne who are amenable to Exxon 51 skipping. As always, it's a true privilege to speak with the Duchenne community. Next slide, please. These are our forward-looking statements. Please refer to our website if you are interested in more details. Next slide, please. So I always like to start with this slide. At Dine, it all begins with our mission. We're laser focused on delivering life transforming therapies to patients with serious muscle diseases, with Duchenne being a priority. Our mission is core to who we are and what we do every single day. And we're incredibly excited to inform you that we started dosing participants in our Dine 251 program. And our focus today is on sharing an update on our clinical trial progress and more details about our clinical trial with Dine 251. Next slide, please. Uh, we've, over the last few years, we've built a robust portfolio focused on rare muscle diseases. Myotonic dystrophy type one or DM1 and FSHD represent opportunities to develop first in class therapies. And in Duchenne, we're building a global franchise starting with our Exxon 51 program. And we'll follow this with programs for Exxon's 53, 45 and 44. Next slide, please. So we're building Dine as the leading muscle disease company to deliver for, pay, uh, for families and patients living with DMD and other muscle diseases. Shown here are three core strengths to help us deliver on that commitment. First, our commitment is to deliver for patients. We've initiated our clinical development program in Duchenne, which has been informed by the patient community and scientific leaders in the field. Second, we have exceptional in-house and advisory expertise with deep knowledge of Duchenne and developing novel therapeutics. We also have a world-class scientific advisory board, which includes luminaries such as Professor Francesca Montoni and Dr. Lou Kunkel. Third, we intentionally designed our program to overcome one of the biggest limitations of current treatments which is effectively and efficiently delivering modern oligonucleotides to muscle tissue. Dine 251, our investigational medicine, is designed to utilize an exon skipping phosphorodiamate morpholino oligomer, or PMO, which I'll talk more about later, to increase dystrophin expression with the goal of significantly altering the course of Duchenne. We believe our technology can better deliver to muscles, including skeletal, respiratory, and heart muscles. And our technology should allow for redosable, tunable, titratable therapy with relatively infrequent dosing. Next slide, please. 
I know that I don't need to spend much time at all describing Duchenne to this audience. We recognize that DMD is a degenerative condition where the lack of the dystrophin protein leads to muscle wasting. And eventually muscle fibers are replaced by fatty or fibrous tissue over time. And while symptoms are seen as young as age two, on average, DMD isn't diagnosed until age four or five. And most individuals with DMD are non-ambulant by their 20s. We've learned so much more from you, the community and advocacy leaders about how this affects the families physically as well as emotionally. And it's you and your loved ones that have taught us so much. Thank you for that. Next slide, please. So this slide depicts the role of exons in producing the dystrophin protein. And I am well aware that the audience understands exon skipping very well. So I'll just briefly uh, go through it. Well, a length or section of DNA is called a gene and each gene is made up of smaller parts called introns and, ex and exons. Uh, the introns are not shown on this particular slide. When the body needs to make a protein, instructions in the DNA are given to a smaller molecule called RNA. During this process, the introns are removed and all the exons are linked together to make one long chain of instructions which are then carried to another part of the cell by something called messenger RNA. Once there, particles in the cells called ribosomes read the instructions in this reading frame here to make the dystrophin pro uh, protein. The mRNA illustrated here comes from the DMD gene and contains 79 exons that are linked together to form the instructions for making dystrophin. Now mutations or errors in the gene alter those instructions for making dystrophin. Types of mutations can include deletions of an exon or multiple exons, duplications of exons, and other changes. The most common mutation is a deletion of one or more exons as shown here. And this leads to the body not being able to produce dystrophin protein. Next slide, please. On this slide, we better illustrate this by focusing on a type of deletion mutation. You can see we show a section of the 79 exons, exons 50 to 57. And if an individual is miss missing exon 52, for example, then the exons no longer fit together. And this is called an out of frame mutation. And since those pieces no longer fit together, the machinery that reads the exons to allow dystrophin to be produced cannot read through the chain of exons. And this results in Duchenne. Next slide, please. So the goal of exon skipping is to allow the body to make the dystrophin protein by skipping an exon and to allow the remaining exons to fit together. Exon skipping splices a gene and restores the reading frame that I referenced earlier, acting as a kind of molecular patch, if you will. So exon skipping encourages the cellular machinery to skip over an exon by masking it with an antisense oligonucleotide or an ASO, which are small pieces of synthesized DNA. In this example, you can see a type of ASO that I referenced earlier called a phosphorodamide morpholino oligomer or PMO that can skip exon 51 to allow the exons to fit together again. This allows the production of a shortened functional form of dystrophin to be produced by the body. Next slide, please. So to date, one of the biggest challenges to developing highly effective exon skipping treatments has been the lack of getting enough of the ASO into muscle cells, such as skeletal, respiratory, and heart muscles. And Dyne is looking to overcome that barrier. Next slide, please. So here I'll take a few minutes to describe the FORCE platform. The FORCE platform drives our efforts to develop and deliver muscle-targeted therapeutics. It's expressly designed to address that one major issue in muscle diseases, which is efficiently and reliably delivering ASOs that target the genetic basis of diseases and being able to alleviate those conditions that you see in the skeletal, cardiac, respiratory, and smooth muscle. As you can see, Dyne's force platform consists of three parts, a proprietary antigen binding fragment or an antibody fragment or what we call a FAB, to enable targeted delivery of the ASO to muscle, a clinically validated linker, and an ASO selected to target the genetic basis of disease. Now I'll start by describing these three components, 
and then come back to the importance of targeting the transferrin receptor 1 or the TFR1 to be able to drive delivery of our investigational medicine. On this slide, you can see a Y-shaped structure on the left-hand side of the slide, which is a monoclonal antibody. Now, we chose a portion of this, our FAB, as I mentioned, because we believe it offers powerful advantages over the larger monoclonal antibodies, including its smaller size, so it can get into cells easier, a lower overall protein load, and the potential for a better tolerability profile. As I mentioned, the goal is ultimately to enable targeted effective delivery of therapeutic molecules to skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Second, we selected the Valsit linker that you see here for our platform based on stability and clinically validated safety and efficacy in approved products. So the linker is used in products that are currently on the market, and we believe this further de-risks the overall force platform. Now we're utilizing the same FAB and linker across all of our programs. The versatility and modularity of our scientific platform provides that flexibility to be able to deploy different types of antisense oligos that are selected to match the target biology for each disease. And where, re where dystrophin restoration is the key, as is in the case in du uh, for Duchenne, it's critical that we select an exon skipping PMO that targets the specific mutation in the DMD gene. Now the mechanism of force is different from other approaches. We're essentially using the cell's natural biology to deliver our investigational medicine to muscle cells. Our FAB binds tightly to something called the transferrin receptor one or TFR1. Now, TFR1 receptors are highly expressed across the surface of muscle cells, including skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscles. So the FAB acts as a kind of key, if you will, that unlocks the TFR1 receptor and allows the antisense oligonucleotide, or the PMO, to enter skeletal, cardiac, respiratory muscles, and other important muscles to target the genetic basis of Duchenne at the level of the nucleus. So we're able to harness what already exists on the surface of muscle cells to deliver our investigational medicine to muscle through this receptor-mediated mechanism. So by targeting muscle specifically by using TFR1, we also have the potential for a wide therapeutic index and hopefully less frequent dosing and chronic administration. Next slide, please. So in this next section, I'll talk about some of the work we undertook prior to entering the clinic with Dyn251, and even some work we did um, you know, after we got into the clinic. Next slide, please. So at Dyn, we've not shied away from using multiple preclinical models available to us to characterize our force platform and gain a deep understanding of Dyn251, our investigational medicine. This work has been critical to inform our approach to get to the clinic and ensure that we have patient safety first and foremost in mind as we put together our clinical development plans and got into the clinic. Importantly, we've looked at non-human primates or NHPs or monkeys to help us understand how much Dyn251 gets into their bodies and how much exon skipping occurs. And because NHPs are not a Duchenne model, we can't look at dystrophin restoration or production in this animal model. And we've also looked at a standard mouse model for Duchenne, the MDX mouse, which has a mutation in exon 23, as well as something called a D2 MDX mouse, which is a more severe Duchenne phenotype. And I'll talk about that data in just a moment. And we've also looked at patient cells, and I'll share just some of this data with you now. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we show our force platform in the MDX mouse, as I mentioned, a standard animal model in Duchenne. And these MDX mice have a mutation in exon 23. You can see that force resulted in robust and durable dystrophin production across key muscles affected by Duchenne with a single dose at 30 milligrams per kilogram and evaluating the mice just four weeks later. The top half of this slide shows some of our data demonstrating robust levels of dystrophin expression across key muscles. 
we were able to achieve high levels of dystrophin expression, about 50% in the quadriceps, uh, about 90% of the diaphragm, and nearly 80% in the heart. And we're really excited to see these levels of dystrophin restoration, especially in the heart and diaphragm, where current PMOs have had limitations. And on the bottom half of the slide, we show dystrophin localization in the sarcolemma muscle membrane after just that single dose. This localization is important to see to provide confidence in potentially seeing functional benefit. And we saw profound results in this experiment, including about 70% dystrophin positive fibers in the quadriceps and about 80% in the diaphragm and heart at four weeks. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I'm really pleased to show newer data that was recently presented at the MDA clinical conference. The D2 MDX mouse is a relatively newer preclinical model consisting of the skeletal muscle pathology associated with Duchenne. Specifically, these mice have characteristics of a severe disease phenotype. This animal model exhibits significant muscle damage, uh, impaired muscle regeneration, and significant fibrosis, among other features, and is a very relevant animal model for DMD research. Here we show data using force, uh, repeat monthly dosing on dystrophin localization at the sarcolemma, as I mentioned in the previous slide, and importantly, progression of fibrosis in the D2 MDX mice. In these experiments, we looked at the D2 MDX mice dosed with a vehicle or placebo, essentially, and repeat monthly doses of 30 milligrams given early in the lifespan of the, of the mice and, and later on in the lifespan. And we evaluated dystrophin localization to the sarcolemma and very importantly, progression of fibrosis. As you can see on the left-hand part of the slide, we compare wild type or, or healthy animals to D2 MDX mice treated with vehicle or dosed early and late with force. And what we saw was robust localization of dystrophin to the sarcolemma membrane, which as I mentioned earlier, provides confidence that there will be a potential functional benefit. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that at baseline, the level of fibrosis at five weeks and 22 weeks. And with both early and late force administration, we can change and reduce the progression of fibrosis. Not surprisingly, earlier treatment is more beneficial than later treatment. So this is some newer, newer data that um, I'm really pleased to present today. Next slide, please. We also evaluated DYNE-251 in non-human primates or in monkeys. Now, these studies are a key step in generating preclinical data before going into clinical trials. We measured exon skipping in the quadriceps, heart, and diaphragm. And just again, as a reminder, please, please recall that we cannot look at dystrophin restoration because these are healthy animals. The key message here is that with our force platform, time on therapy matters. Over a two month period, we observed robust exon skipping across muscles. At five weekly 30 milligram per kilogram doses, DYNE 251 demonstrated about 50% exon skipping in the diaphragm, about 40% in the heart, and about 20% in the quadriceps. So again, really pleased to see this level of exon skipping and especially the penetration in the heart and diaphragm. We also evaluated DYNE-251 in, in uh, two different toxicology studies in monkeys. In both studies, we saw that DYNE-251 had a favorable safety profile with no dose-limiting toxicity observed up to a maximally feasible dose, which simply means that we couldn't actually formulate higher, and so we went to the um, highest dose we could formulate. And we're really pleased with the safety profile as we advanced into the clinic. Next slide, please. So in this next part, I'll talk about our phase one, two study called DELIVER. Next slide, please. So prior to starting our DYNE 251 clinical development program, we proactively obtained expert feedback. We engaged key opinion leaders or KOLs from various disciplines, including pediatric and adult neurology, cardiology, physical medicine and rehabilitation or pain management, pulmonology, and physical therapy. Importantly, we've gathered this feedback from across the globe. 
Now, KOLs both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., including Europe, with experience running early and late stage trials, have provided advice on our overall clinical development program, including on our clinical trial design, the patient population we should be studying, biomarker and functional endpoints, and key safety considerations. And importantly, they have helped us to extract key learnings from natural history studies. It's clear that KOLs believe dystrophin continues to be a key endpoint for this condition. We've also received advice directly from patients and caregivers, as well as global advocacy leaders, such as those from PPMD and the Duchenne Community Advisory Board, comprising of advocacy leaders from several countries around the world. They provided insights based on their living with and being the voice of the Duchenne community, as well as experience with past and current trials. This input has been critical in ensuring a patient-centric design and has included, but is not limited to key considerations for choosing a clinical trial, review of and input to our informed consent form, feedback on biopsies and functional outcomes, identification of the most burdensome or difficult parts of the trial, and how to ensure patients and families are supported throughout the process. And based on this extensive feedback, we developed the clinical study for DYNE 251 that I'll go through in just a moment. Next slide, please. So our clinical trial for DYNE 251 is a global trial consisting of essentially four periods. We have a six week screening period followed by a 24 week placebo controlled multiple ascending dose period where individuals receive either placebo or DYNE 251 administered every four weeks. Now this is followed by a 24 week open label extension period where all participants will be escalated to the highest safe dose of DYNE 251 administered every four weeks. And then finally a 96 week long-term extension period. It's important to note that following the placebo-controlled portion of the study, all patients will be able to receive active treatment. We plan to evaluate the following outcomes in the delivered trial, uh, such as safety and tolerability, dystrophin as measure, uh, measured by Western blot, muscle function relevant to both ambulatory and non-ambulatory participants, such as the NSAA and performance of upper limb function, to help us understand changes in lower and upper limb function. We also carefully assess lung and heart function. And importantly, we are dosing monthly in the clinic and have the potential to explore even less frequent dosing than that. With the help of our expert advisors, we're really confident that our study design is robust, will measure key outcomes, and is striving to manage the burden on families. I'm also pleased to say that we will be communicating some initial safety, tolerability, and dystrophin data in the second half of this year. Next slide, please. This slide shows a select set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Much more detail can be found on our clinicaltrials.gov site, uh, including open clinical trial sites. We are enrolling patients with Duchenne who have mutations amenable to exon 51 skipping therapy. And our goal is to enroll about 46 participants ages four to 16 who are either ambulant or non-ambulant. We do require open biopsies of the upper arm muscle in this study. And participants should be receiving stable steroid doses for at least three months before the start of study drug administration. And if someone has been on exon skipping therapies, we require a 12-week washout period. Again, please visit the ct.gov website for more details on inclusion and exclusions, as well as a listing of currently recruiting sites in the U.S. and around the world. Next slide, please. And finally, we have tried to take every opportunity to listen to the Duchenne community on their needs for next-generation treatments. We're working urgently to deliver for the community, including families and healthcare providers, to bring a potentially transformative treatment forward. Thank you to the families for being generous with your thoughts, advice, and for the sacrifices that you continue to make. And on behalf of Dine, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention to listen to this presentation. 
Um, and at this point, uh, Molly and I are pleased to take any questions from the community. Thank you, Ash. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, yeah, so if we have any questions for those in the audience, please feel free to submit them um, to the chat box. We'll try to get through as many of them as, as we can in the time that we have. Um, while we kind of wait for some of those uh, to come in, um, I think it'd be helpful sometimes I like to go back through some of the slides and, and talk through some of the pieces just to make sure if, if families are unfamiliar or if they're new to this. So if we could go back to um, maybe back to slide 11 and then we can kind of go through a few of them um, from there. Um, and I can just kind of throw this one at you while we're, we're getting back there. But one of the things I think you, you were talking about was the force platform for Dyn is something that you're using across um, not just Duchenne and not just the other exons um, that you might, uh, or exon skipping uh, therapies that you might develop, um, but it's something you intend to use in, you know, the same platform for myotonic and other um, applications. So are you learning across there in terms of kind of the safety profile with these different um, components? And, and yeah, I think to apply yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. A great, great yeah. question. So, so the answer is absolutely yeah. So, um, we're we're also um, dosing patients now for our adult onset myotonic dystrophy type one program, um, and so because we utilize the same fab and linker, and we have obviously an antisense that attacks the genetic basis of disease for for myotonic dystrophy. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're informed on the overall. Um, prowess of the platform, safety profile of the platform, and, and other aspects um, uh, by, by thinking about, um, you know, the data that's being generated from, from both programs. So there's definitely, um, you know, one program informs the other, and it's the, it's the right thing to do. We need to be thinking about the safety profile holistically um, uh, as, as well as with the individual programs. So we're learning a great deal right now. And, 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 and the other piece of it is that um, in the second half of this year, We'll also be communicating safety and tolerability data from the myotonic program. So we also want to give the community, the broader community, visibility into, you know, what that profile looks like for both programs. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, do you want to add anything to that? Nope. I right. sounds perfect. And I think it's helpful too um, for families who maybe, you know, I think at this point there's obviously a lot of familiarity with with PMOs and kind of the exon skipping piece, but this these conjugation methods and the differences, could you just kind of uh, explain what happens if it's, you know, you're obviously using this conjugated um, with the, the antigen binding fragment. What happens if you were to just deliver the PMO on its own in terms of getting to tissues in the body? Yeah, so um, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's important to, to talk about this. And I'm, I, I'm also happy to talk about maybe how this differs from other um, next gen uh, treatments and development. So um, in terms of the, the unconjugated um, PMO delivery, there's a, quite a bit of data out there from uh, existing PMOs uh, and PMOs that are on the market, at least in the United States and a select other handful of markets um, that um, have shown the ability to um, have modest uh, dystrophin restoration. And the question is, you know, that I think has been asked and answered is why is that um, dystrophin restoration so modest uh, over time, even going out to say, you know, 180 weeks and, you know, a little over, over 1%. Um, it's because the PMOs are not really able to penetrate those muscle tissue uh, very well, and they need help. And, and, and so what what many companies are, are working on, those who've been in the Duchenne space, those who are newer to the Duchenne space, are working on better delivery methods. So whether it's a attaching a peptide to the PMO, so the PPMOs or these cell-penetrating peptides attached to PMO, that's one, um, uh, one strategy to be able to drive more of the, of the PMO. Uh, into the muscle cells. And there's some clinical data that's been, been put out there by uh, a couple of companies on their cell penetrating peptide um, technology, um, both efficacy data and safety data. And there, there are challenges because um, the, the, the mechanism by which uh, um, uh, these, these 
peptides allow the PMO to, to get into the cell is still being elucidated. What I can say is what, what uh, the Dyne platform, what, what the FORCE platform doesn't do is, is any sort of membrane destabilization. We aren't poking holes in cells to drive the PMO. As I mentioned, we are targeting, uh, we're, we're using this transferrin receptor that's ubiquitous, right? It's, it's highly expressed across the skeletal muscle, the diaphragm, the cardiac muscle. And we're, we're using this receptor mediated mechanism to drive that PMO uh, into, into the muscle cell and so that the ASO can escape the endosome and get into the nucleus. And so it's really using what already exists on these muscle cells, our natural biology, uh, to drive the PMO uh, in there. Other companies are using other vehicles like endosomal escape, um, and, and there's a lot of other, other modalities out there. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to make sure is that we have really, really um, um, robust on-target effects by using the cell's natural biology and, and trying to limit uh, off-target effects. And some of those off-target effects or some of those um, other issues, you know, which have been seen in other programs are things we're trying to avoid, like the, like the low magnesium, for example. Right. No, thank you. Yeah, it's, it always does get a little bit more challenging as we start to make these uh, potential therapies more complex, but uh, that's helpful. If we could go to slide um, 14, um, and I think this is just an important piece in terms of, um, you know, as families kind of learn to look at data um, as, as this is presented, because, uh, you know, this was, it's exciting data, um, but, and you, you did talk through this a little bit, but to just reinforce that, you know, this is done in the mouse, which has a different mutation than what you are designing with, um, you know, your 51 platform. So it's a, it's a different sequence that's being used here. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, of course. Yeah. I'll definitely clarify a bit more. So um, this MDX mouse is a, is a preclinical model that um, has been around for, for quite some time. And, and it's a fantastic model. It's a standard model um, to, you know, to Eric's, uh, good point. It has a mutation for exon 23. So we are not using Dyne 251 in this mouse model. We're using a, um, a force conjugate, a tool compound that is appropriate for skipping exon 23. And, and we use this to understand a few things. Um, some of the data that's not shown is how much of the force conjugate is getting into these cells. So the concentration piece. And so what we see in this particular experiment is after a single dose of 30 milligrams, and we look at these animals four weeks later, we see that um, we see peak concentration in about three days, peak exon skipping at about week one and peak dystrophin at about week four. And that, you know, that's roughly um, kind of the pattern that we're seeing. Um, so this model really helps us understand the, you know, uh, is our force conjugate able to do what it needs to do on all levels, get into the cell, do the exon skipping, and then also produce dystrophin. And then we also have experiments we've done in, um, in uh, behavioral, uh, sorry, in, uh, in motor function tests in, in mice, and we've seen benefits uh, there as well. And that's been presented uh, in the past. So what you have here is one way for us to uh, look at the quantification or semi-quantification of uh, dystrophin. And again, what we're really pleased to see is this level of dystrophin production in these tissue, but especially the ability for us to get into the diaphragm and heart because current modalities like you know the unconjugated PMO um, haven't really been shown uh, to be able to get into, into the heart and a little bit into the diaphragm. And we know that this is absolutely you know, critically important. And on the bottom is something called PDPF or dystroph, you know, uh, positive dystrophin fibers. Um, it's a it's a it's a measurement that's also been around and, and really important from a, a KOL perspective, from a regulatory perspective. And is the dystrophin going to where it needs to go? And here we can you know feel confident that with this model and this experiment, it's getting to the to the muscle membrane and hopefully shoring up that membrane um, uh, for uh, for the relevant muscles. Eric, does that? No, help? that was perfect. Yeah, I think it's important just for you know um, families to come to this and maybe don't understand drug development always. That you know one of the challenges we have with genetic therapies is that we don't always have a perfect animal model that's going to match the exact kind of variant in the Duchenne gene that we are, are hoping for. 
Um, and so this is the way that it's done. Um, so it's just, I think it's helpful as, as families kind of look at this always to, you know, have those little teachable moments if possible. Um, and then similar, just as just to, to reinforce, I think on, on slide 16, because you had pointed this out when you went through the different animal models um, and cell models that Dine's uh, been looking at. Um, this is just a reminder if anyone's looking at this, you know, the reason why within the monkeys here, you're just looking at exon skipping and not um, dystrophin uh, expression. Yeah, sure. So, so just to um, actually tee off of one of Eric's points. So, doing studies in um, in multiple species is um, pretty typical. Uh, so here we go into uh, NHPs, a larger species, to again do a few things. Um, one. Um, are we able to uh, get Dyne 251 in this case to match up with some of the observations seen in a smaller animal model, you know, in, in, in the mice? Uh, and so what we are able to see is that Dyne 251 is very efficiently getting into the muscle tissue. And again, that data is not shown here. So are we able to deliver it the way we have have? Um, seen it being delivered in, in rodents, and we're seeing robust delivery and good concentrations in, in muscle cells. The second thing is, is it showing exon skipping? Um, as, as I alluded to before, these are healthy animals. They, they are producing dystrophin. Um, so there is no, um, there's no dystrophic state that they are in as the mice, the MDX mice, are in a dystrophic state. So you don't have that here. What you can do is disrupt some of their normal function, and you can create exon skipping. And so what we're able to do is deliver this, see that it gets into tissues, and then measure the exon skipping that occurs in key muscles. But what you can't see is like dystrophin restoration, right? There's not that ability to see it because they're, they're healthy, they're producing it. Um, there's a hypothesis that if you treat them long, you know, it, you know, it, you know, if you do chronic treatment with exon skipping, and who knows what that looks like, that perhaps you can put them in more of a dystrophic state. But that's not, you know, that's not the case of of what we're trying to elucidate here, or any company would want to elucidate in that in that particular case. And then, and then the other thing is safety and tolerability. It's really important to understand um, if this is well tolerated, if it's safe. Um, and what's happening in this larger species in NHPs. So we are carefully assessing kidney function, liver function, cardiac function, neurologic function, um, uh, uh, you know, even weight changes. And we didn't even see any weight changes uh, occurring uh, in these two toxicology studies. Um, and the other nice thing is in the five-week study, we dosed these animals weekly. We really gave them like, you know, frequent doses um, to see what would happen if you attack that receptor. And in the 13-week study, it was more akin to what were our dosing paradigm in the clinic, you know, monthly dosing. So um, again, these two studies gave us a great deal of confidence in, in the safety profile. Um, and so we needed to do this work before we moved into, um, into actual patients. Oh, great. That was a great explanation. Thank you. Um, and then if we go to slide 20, and I think we can probably bring in the other question that we had um, there. I did want to ask I had a, a couple of questions for you here, one of which was, as you were going through this, you mentioned, and then it might have been in the previous slide, but you, I think you had just mentioned, um, there's the possibility of even less frequent dosing. So currently you're going every four weeks, that's when the patients will have their infusion. Um, but you mentioned that, so I, I was hoping you could maybe yeah. expand a little bit on that. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that I'll be able to expand a whole lot right now. But we we know that, and this comes back to your your good point. Learning from the DM one program, right? So what we are what we're seeing with the preclinical work with the force platform, and what I think we're going to be learning as we get you know data from these two programs is the ability to dose less frequently. Um, in the myotonic program, we are looking at um, dosing every eight weeks as well as every four weeks. So we're trying to learn from both programs. And so that's why I say there's potential for even, even less frequent dosing in, in the Duchenne program. But for now, 
it's a, it's every four weeks, which we still think is is certainly um, sort of um, you know uh, an improvement over current modalities. No, that's great. Um, and then as you're thinking about the open label and then especially it's the long-term extension, we did have a question around potential for um, home dosing. Um, and does this change as well, uh, you know, as you know, with, with it being global, different countries and, and um, other challenges potentially there? Yeah, it's, it's a question we get frequently. So um, a, a few things. I think home infusion of the drug is something that we absolutely have discussed and, and would love to be able to get to. I, I would just remind the audience that this is a phase one, two safety and tolerability study. And of course, we're looking at dystrophin and, and other, other measures. And so um, in an effort to be prudent, to think about patient safety first and foremost, um, we do require all dosing to be in the clinic. For now, we've just started our clinical trials and um, we really want to be mindful of patient safety. Um, so we will get to a place where we have home infusion, perhaps if it's not in this study, in, in our next set of studies. Um, so we're, we're definitely aware that this is important for the community. But right now, this is the phase one, two safety toler tolerability study. And we want to be um, prudent about, about where we dose uh, patients. And for the um, for the biopsies, you said it is in the the bicep, and so will they have a baseline and then a follow up um, further along in the study? Yeah, I, I think I wasn't clear about that. Sorry. So yes, two two biopsies, one at baseline pre treatment, uh, and then one at uh, twenty four weeks after you know at the end of the placebo uh, period will be a second biopsy um, of the of the bicep, um, and you know if. For some reason, the um, the investigator feels like the bicep isn't appropriate at that time or or, or that point. Um, it could be another muscle in the upper arm, right? Like the deltoid or something. Mm -hmm. And then I and you said this, and I just want to make sure, just reinforce for for anyone listening. You said when you when patients transition into the open label, they would move to whatever the the highest tolerable dose is from the multiple ascending dose study. Yeah, so um, there's a whole process and procedure associated with this, and I won't go into it all. Um, we obviously have a you know a, a safety review committee, right? You know, at multiple points throughout the entire study, which is um, absolutely the the thing every company should be doing. We certainly are doing it, and so um, you know, if a patient is entering the OLE and we're at a higher safe dead dose that's been deemed. Uh, you know, safe by our our, our safety committee, uh, then that family or that patient can move into that um, into that higher dose. So it doesn't have to be this stepwise progression, you know, uh, over time. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the next slide, um, just to clarify, we sometimes get this question. So sure. you know, it's you said it need to be on stable steroid dose. Um, yeah. Is is are you excluding it all? Given this is global, you might have patients on daily deflazacort, daily pred, wow. weekend pred, 10 on, 10 off. Is it as long as just whatever they are doing is stable for that time and you're not um, restricting kind of what their doctors um, prescribed? Yeah, pre precisely. So it could be um, prednisone or deflazacort or something else. It could be intermittent daily, weekend. So it's just whatever whatever the physician has deemed as the you know the the, the regimen that's best suited for that um, for that participant. They just need to be having that stable dose and dose regimen for at least three months. Now that said, over time we know that there needs to be dose adjustments for say weight gain or 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 something like that. And so you know the study allows for adjustments for you know those kinds of reasons. And then we had a question around the placebo group. So is that one-to-one um, -one randomization for that period? No, no, oh, uh, great question. No, it's, uh, I don't have a picture of all of the, the cohorts here, um, but it's, uh, it starts at two-to-one uh, randomization. Uh, and then at the, the higher dose uh, cohorts, it shifts to a three-to-one randomization. And the first two cohorts in the in the U.S. Uh, do not require biopsies, 
we only require a box okay. biopsy in the US starting at the third cohort. So it's 0 0.7, 1 0.4, 2.8. And so at that third cohort, we require a um, uh, we require biopsies, but not for those first two cohorts in the US. Yeah. And outside of the US, just so we're clear, outside of the US, we're starting at a higher dose. Um, and we start off with needing biopsies at that higher dose outside of the US. So will you be enrolling um, patients in the US sites earlier than? Sites are opening up globally, They're, or is it all the same? We're enrolling globally. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, so, uh, one, uh, you know, we had another question around. Uh, obviously, a number of patients, especially U.S. based, um, could be already on something like a mm -hmm. Um and we also have, you know, there are a number of other other studies as well with um, targeting exon fifty one. Uh, skippable um, or amenable to exon 51 skipping. Um, do you envision any challenges with that? And then I, I do have a follow-up question as well. If, if patients are, if they're on a Tepler sin, kind of what is their best process? Should they reach out to their, to their, uh, the site that's near them to express interest and then kind of talk with the coordinator on and, and their clinicians around what, what the washout should look like? Yeah. Um, so on your, on your first question, um, we have not seen uh, the impact of current, you know, PMO use in the U.S. on our uh, ability to enroll in our clinical trials. Um, we we think it's great that there are options um, in the U.S. and um, and so you know we we haven't seen an impact on us to be able to get trials up and running and, and get patients uh, sites up and running and get. Um, uh, uh, patients enrolled um, so thus far. In terms of um, how to think about uh, whether or not uh, a, a patient or a family should come off of a prior exon skipping therapy, obviously, um, you know, we would never give any advice on that um, in terms of what to do uh, other than, yes, speak to your, your uh, physician that's caring for you and speak to the site physician as well. Obviously, they could be very, you know, two different individuals um, and, and see what the, the best thing is for the family. Evaluate all the options, right? There's multiple exon skipping therapy trials out there. There's multiple gene therapy trials out there. I mean, you know, this is a good conversation to have with your treating physician, the site physician, and, and certainly, you know, what's best for the family. And at the end of the day, we just, we want all of these modalities to come to the market. We want these all to be available to, to families. Um, and, um, and I think there's amazing physicians out there that'll provide really great guidance. And then uh, my, my last question for you, as you said, expectation is being able to share data second half of 2023. That's correct. Yeah. It'll be safety, tolerability and, and dystrophin. Well, we, we look forward to that and, you know, we would be more than happy to have you back to, to share that with the community. Um, yeah, Ash, Molly, thank you so much for the, the presentation today and for um, taking time to, to share uh, additional information and, and some of the kind of drug development piece with the community. It's always really welcome. Um, and for everyone who is uh, tuned in today, um, just a reminder that this is being recorded, so we will post it back to PPMD's website. So please feel free to share with your um, friends and family. Um, it'll likely sometime in the next uh, next week, it'll it'll be up. Um, but yeah, Ash, Molly, thank you again um, for joining us. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you so much. Bye.